Hey, let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for the scripture sung over us that reminds us of your great love for us. Lord, we thank you that this is love, that you have sent your son, Jesus, as an atoning sacrifice for our, our sin. And Lord, I pray that anyone who is hearing my voice here in uh, the presence of your spirit, anyone watching this perhaps at home or online, I pray, Lord, that today would be the day, even now, they would receive your grace that's come to them in Jesus. You've already done all that is necessary. I pray today would be the day of salvation in the lives of many who need to, to turn to you, to come to you. And Lord, I pray that you would draw each of us to you today in this moment of refining that, that you're, you're doing here in your church here in America and across the world. I pray that we would uh, stand up and be counted among those who are more committed than we've ever been before. All because of your love, not our love for you, but your love for us that then prompts us to a life of worship. So Lord, open our ears and our minds and our hearts now as we open your word. We pray in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Wow, what a great day. It is so good to be here to worship the Lord with you. And hey, if you are a guest, uh, again, I'd love to meet you. Uh, people ask, hey, what are you guys about? And here's what we answer, okay? All of our members, like somebody this week, what are you guys about there? And real simply put, we say it this way, we're all about Jesus. That's it. If you hadn't figured that out yet, uh, being with us here today, then you've missed something because that's what we're all about. If you want to know what we talk about, if you want to know why we come together, if you want to know why we have connect groups, why we open his word, why we're here, he is the head of our church. Not the pastor, not a staff, not any group of people. Christ is the head. And so for the next few weeks, uh, we're going to do something. We're going to kind of push pause and say, wow, where are we now in this cultural moment as we uh, come out of the rubble that is the pandemic? And it feels a bit like we're coming out. And we said months ago, there's going to be this new normal. It's never going to be the same, right? None of us knew what that would look like. And it's not all glorious, frankly. We're coming out of it and yet we're thinking, but yet it's not, we're not out yet or it's not like it was. And we're experiencing a lot and we've talked a lot. Even months ago, we said, you know, what we're experiencing is grief. Let's name it and let's walk through it together. But come to realize as I was seeking to guide a lot of us through that season, our staff included, we weren't even ready to process because we're still experiencing loss. And I think just now, as we start to come out of it, maybe it'll be in the new year that we start to think this pandemic truly is behind us. And now things are, are getting back to some sense of normalcy. But I remember when my father died, um, Dr. Jack Martin and I were talking and with a lot of just personal, very personal losses um, in my life in a season, he said, Jeff, it's grief. That's what you're walking through. And just to name it was helpful for me, you know, because grief has a process and I think we're all in this process and what's going on in our culture nowadays is what some have called the great sort. Uh, Ed Stetzer is the one who called it the great sort. It's a sorting out. We're seeing this in church world in particular. We're seeing it really across the life of, of people in, in America and really across the world. We've talked about the great resignation. People leaving their jobs, people moving on to something else, people not returning to what they were doing formerly. We see the great sort being played out in the church. Ed Stetzer is the chair of the uh, Billy Graham Mission and Evangelism um, Center at Wheaton College. He's a writer, blogger, and speaker. Uh, but he and the team have done a lot of research with churches across our nation, in particular here in America. He said, you can kind of break it down in, in these three ways. Third of your people are all in more than they've ever been. And I've seen that. Our staff, our team, we talked about it. We see it. I'm speaking to a lot of you in the room right now. All in. More than ever before. Let's go. And I, I praise, praise God for you. For all of you who are part of that group. There's about a third. They, they say that you don't know where they are. They've gone AWOL. They, they're, they're not back yet. Or they're not coming back. Some research, we, they, they noted early on, people are gone and not coming back. And I think numbers are bearing that out, not just here, but across the nation. 
There's a lot of different reasons for that, I suppose. And we've been unpacking that a bit. And then he says, about a third of your people are new. And many of them are actually, some are saying, we're, we're experiencing revival. No, they're actually coming from other churches, is what they're doing. Because uh, Ed Stetzer says this, he says 30% of people coming to your church that are new are, are, are coming because they left their prior church because of how they handled the pandemic. Mask or no mask throughout. I mean, all the stuff, right? And I, I know for me, a lot of grief that I've experienced as a pastor leader has been, we've been in meetings where like every decision over the past year and a half, gonna upset half the church probably right about now. And that, you know, that grieves me from the start as a pastor who loves every person. Stetzer, he writes this, people right now in the U.S. in particular are sorting themselves out into groups where they align ideologically and politically, not so much theologically anymore. Wow. That speaks to the lack of discipleship and spiritual formation in the lives of churchgoers. I'd like to think our church is ahead of the game on that one. And I think we are. But we're seeing a lot of that. And so what do we do with all of this? I was talking to members earlier, even this morning. What do we do? We commit ourselves to the Lord Jesus more than we ever have before. And in a time of confusion, we need clarity. Clarity is king. And so that's what we're going to be doing over these next few weeks. Even as I set up our message for the day. Um, I'm reminded that Jesus experienced um, a time in his ministry where people were leaving. You don't have to turn there, but just to set this up a little bit more. In John 6, you might remember there's a crowd. He feeds the 5,000. He leaves over to the other side of the lake and they end up like, where is he? And they find him. They come back to him and they say, hey, we're back. And Jesus says, um, no, y'all, you guys are just here for the show is basically what he says. You're here because you, you got bread. And I'm telling you, you're, you're here to watch for more manna to come from the sky. You're just here for the miracle. You're just here for the show. And that's not why I'm here. I'm not here for the show. He says, in fact, he goes, I'm the bread of life. And then they're like, what? what? And he says, and he goes on to say, if you eat my flesh and drink my blood, then you can come and follow after me. And then the disciples, or maybe like the communications team, the branding team, they're like, that's not going over well. Like, that's not, you need, that is not, we need to stop that. Because people are leaving in droves, is what they tell them. And then you know what he does. He turns to them. He kind of doubles down. I mean, it's like he's thinning the herd intentionally. And he says, are are you guys going to leave now? Because I'm not changing the message. If you're going to be all in, you're going to die to yourself, take up your cross, you're going to follow me, and the eating of flesh, drinking of blood is to say, we're going to partake of your mission and what you've called us to. And Jesus says, I'm calling you to a life of self-denial. To die to yourself and serve others with your life. Even enemy love. Loving people who don't look like you, don't think like you, don't vote like you. I'm calling you to love everyone. Now, if you're in on that, come follow me. But don't follow me because you want me to align with your ideologies or your your own preferences and all of those things. So who's in? Jesus' message hasn't changed. Ours will not change. Friends, listen. He is still the way. He is still the truth. He's still the life, only in Christ. And we must commit ourselves anew. And today, that's what this message is about and messages to come over the next couple of weeks because we want to talk about how we are better together. We we need to come back to commit ourselves to be on mission with him. And, And I'd say it this way. Here's a real clear couple of statements and we'll jump into the text here in a moment. PCBC exists, here it is, to lead all generations to love Jesus. This is how we say it simply. We praise God that we are in a, you know, multiple generations, cross-generational church. I love that about our church. And we exist to lead all generations, lead and love. And how do we do this? Simply put, we gather and send out to live and love like Jesus. We gather and send out 
to live a life that comprehensively looks like the life of Jesus. We're going to talk a lot about that in the coming year. We have been. And we then are led to love people like he's called us to love. That's what's going to reach this generation and particularly in these moments as we come out of this thing. His mission hadn't changed, nor has ours. So the next three weeks, we're going to talk about sharing the gospel today. We're going to talk about moving forward. We're going to talk about living in unity, three components to this new normal that we're going to be living in. And today we find ourselves in, uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14 through 21. All of this to set up this series and this message today. Today we're going to see that we're better together because we are ministers, we are ambassadors, and we are storytellers. This is one of my favorite passages in scripture is where we landed. It lands on what has become my life verse over many decades um, that is the gospel in a single sentence. You've heard me talk about it if you've been around here much. We're now in Corinth. We're not in Philippi anymore if you've been with us. Uh, and the church in Corinth, not like the church in Philippi, they are divided. There's division and Paul is seeking to unite the church around Jesus and he's been saying, hey, if we seem out of our minds at times, uh, we're just crazy about Jesus. Uh, If we seem normal, then it's for your sake so we can bridge the gap. But he says, either way, verse 14, either way, and I'm reading from the New Living Translation here. Either way, Christ's love controls us. It's his love that compels us. This word is to constrain us, to hold fast. It keeps us together. It, it, it keeps us compelled together and individually. But yes, together, we're, it, his love controls. We've sung about it. The choir sang over it. This is love. This is our response. Since we believe that Christ died for all, we also believe that we all have all died to our old way of life. We too have died. And, and now we live a new life in him. Look at verse 15. He died for everyone. So that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they live, will live for Christ who died and was raised up for them. He's saying he's already died. All that's necessary for our salvation has been done. We've received that by faith. It's all been accomplished for us. Karl Barth, the great German theologian, they asked him when he was saved. He said 33 A.D. Because all that's necessary has already happened. There's no work that we bring to the table. We bring nothing to the table, we say it this way, but our sin that makes our salvation necessary and his death on the cross necessary. So we, we turn to him by faith and then it says he, he died and then he was raised. So now we're raised up to live a new life, his resurrected life in us And then look at verse 16. So we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. We don't see anyone the way we used to. At one time, we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view. A lot of people do, right? Claiming he was just a great religious leader. Maybe he was the best of all. He is so much more than that. How differently we know him now, he says. We see now everyone through the lens of Jesus Friends, as we live our life this week, we look at everyone through the loving lens of Christ, through the grace of Christ. And so he's saying, we don't measure people according to to worldly things. Everybody else wants us to do that. We don't look first at people's looks or success or, or talents according to their nationality or ethnicity, even their gender or politics. We now see everyone through the lens of the loving eyes of Jesus because that's who we are now. We love everyone. Everyone has a place at the foot of the cross. And so we love everyone with great freedom and all the love that we need, we've already found in him so we can love everyone without any need for love in return. That is such a wonderful way to live. Just love people. Just outgrace everybody today. And be careful. Catch yourself making judgments about people the moment you see them. We all are prone to do this, but now we see people. Look, there's only two types of people in the world. Those who are in Christ, those who are brothers and sisters, sons and daughters of God, who now have entered into a relationship with him, and then those who are destined apart from him because they've not yet received his grace. 
We know we talk about Christianity being the difference between religion and relationship. Everybody has a relationship with God. You're either hell-bound, disobedient, sons and daughters of his wrath, destined for eternity to part from him, or you have received his grace and you're a son or daughter of the Most High King, already living in eternity. And I say this because we need to see everyone in this way. Look at verse 17. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. He's saying, look, don't you see it? We see everything differently. We live new now. The old is gone. The word is, is archaios in the Greek. It means the original thing. The thing that has always been is gone. And he says, and a new life has begun. This word new, the, the Greek nuances help us here a little bit. Kainos, you've heard, probably heard that word. Kainos in the Greek means unprecedented, novel. It means never before seen. This is not like, like cleaning up an old thing to make it look new. This is totally new. And, and some, some uh, translations say, behold, this is a new thing. I was thinking about a, like a little, little sapling or a, a plant, maybe a flower you plant, you know, sometime off. And then you see it coming up in the springtime. And it's like, look, there it is. It's coming. It's appearing. That's what the, the Greek, even the language there is. It's coming into view is what it means. It's coming on stage. The light is coming on it. There it is. And this is the way we're to live. For people to see us when we show up. Look, behold, there's a new person. Look at verse 20 or 18. Look at verse 18. And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ, reconciled us back to God in Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling, this ministry of reconciliation, reconciling people to him. He's given us a gift. And so we come alongside others. It's like this. I, th this is, th this is the, the image here. Again, the language helps us here. It's like having invitations to a party. And there's a big party that's being thrown and you have invitations and you're just going around. This week, friends, this is the life we live. You have an invitation and people you know, it's got their name on it. Because Christ has placed you, God has placed you among a certain pe group of people in your little corner of the world. And you've got, you, I'm thinking of Johnny Appleseed from the old story. We're going around, we're just, we're just throwing out invitations to everybody we know. But, it, but your name is on this invitation and God wants me to invite you. It says he's entrusted to us. Imagine that. We've been you have been entrusted to the same ministry that was the ministry of Jesus. And now he's called you to do the same. You know, I was with our church planners this week. I mean, so many exciting things happening. Just hearing from Bailey today, you know, makes my heart beat a little faster. Love him. Love our residents and all that God's doing. Raising up, these have been called into ministry, vocational ministry, church planners saying, God's called me to plant a church. We have a lot of retired ministers. I know in our, in our uh, church family, we have those who serve. Maybe you're an ordained uh, licensed minister in some other form, some other uh, ministry. We have a lot of folks who are that way. In fact, I'm curious, how many of you how many right here today, how many ministers do we have uh, here in the room? Just kind of raise your hand. The ministers here in the room. Yeah. Okay. Let me, um, let me, uh, let me not, not so fast. Y'all don't understand the text. I'm sorry. Uh, Y'all don't get it. That's a little bit of a trick question. Not so much. Listen, every single one of us, we are ministers you are a minister every single one of us look at this verse 19 for God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself no longer counting people's sins against them and he has given us this wonderful message or ministry of reconciliation every single one of us one of the problems in the church is that we have have this laity like clergy distinction and yes, are those called out? And yes, we, we sh should applaud and, and praise God for those who've been called out. The scriptures tell us to do so, to honor those who called out to lead us. So there's that distinction, but we're all ministers. And it says here, the word message is actually word, it's logos. We've been given a word about reconciliation. 
And it is the great rescue. The Greek word, in fact, he has entrusted to us, he set upon us, placed on us, established us. The word could be ordained us to all serve him. We've been given a trust. We are ministers, and not just ministers, we're ministers of reconciliation. That's what we do. That's who we are. That's who you are. Every single one of us here. So that begs the question, what is your ministry? And you can say, well, of reconciliation. How are you living that out? Where do you do that? And granted, not just a Sunday morning, though this is a place to start. Many of you need to step up and serve in the church family. I was, I was talking to the Springers earlier. They welcome folks at the chapel, uh, Debbie and Terry Springer. Some of you know them, been around here a long time. They're serving all the time. And I just, I just come upon them again. I just say, thank you so much. Y'all are always serving. You're always, I go to youth camp. You're serving. There they are. They're serving young adults. And you know what? They, they responded like every servant does. With big smiles on their faces. They said, we just love this. Friends, the happiest people, happiest members in the church are those who serve. Have you figured this out yet? This is the upside down kingdom. Otherwise, we're prone to step on campus or into a group or whatever, into the church and say, what, what's in it for me? That's our, that's our bent. What's in it for me? And then you know what that does? It leads to critique, complaining, and, and just frustration. R Rodney Shell said it last week. I said something similar in the gray hall. You're about as happy as you want to be in a church. Happy are those, blessed is the word Jesus used. Blessed are those who serve others. Do you believe it? Some of you are prompted even now to say, I need to give some time. I need to give some of my energies and my life to the church. New opportunities to serve all the time. So talk to us, talk to ministers that you know. Contact us, we'd love to help you. So we are ministers. I'll close with this. Uh, two more things, we are ambassadors. You can see it there. We're representatives. You know, an ambassador is one, right, who is a resident of one country, but a citizen of another. We're now new creatures of the kingdom of God. We know who our king is. We're representatives now in our corner of the world. And it says in verse 20, so we are Christ ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. I love that. The, the translation there, you might see um, there's, a, there's an appeal that's coming. And in some, uh, some translations, there's a colon, I think the ESV. And then it says, be reconciled to God. In some translations, it actually in quotes, this is our message. Come back to God. Be reconciled to God. And he's making his appeal through us. Where Jesus Christ was the location of God's presence in the incarnation, he comes making the appeal to God, the Father, to say, be reconciled to God. He dies on the cross, be reconciled to the Father through me. And now he is using us, making the same appeal, be reconciled to God. This week, friends, you and I are his representative wherever he places us. To, in, again, in our corner of the world, to be promoters, persuaders, lovers, accomplishing his agenda. We're not just ambassadors. We are ambassadors of Christ. He's making his appeal through us. Be reconciled to God. We are ministers. We are ambassadors. And thirdly, finally, we are storytellers. In fact, we now know that all of life is a story. You were born into a story, already happening, already taking place. The, the German theologians have a term for it. It's Heil Geschichte. It's the, it's the redemptive story of God. How they interpret all of history through the redemptive work of God with Christ as the central rescuer through it all. It's the gospel story. What story are you telling with your life, with people who know you? Because your story matches up now with his great story and you tell others, you appeal to others, be reconciled to God, join the story. Join the story of God. And what is the story? In a single verse, verse 21. For God made him, Christ, who knew no sin, okay, who never sinned, to become sin for us, to be the offering of sin 
for our, or for our sin so that we might become, right, be made right, become the righteousness of God in him or through Christ. What, what a joy it is for us to have this message of reconciliation and we get to go and tell other people about it. We're storytellers, but not just storytellers. We're storytellers of the gospel. That's the story. We sang about it earlier. We love to tell the story. Is that true of us? Was that just an aspiring song? We're just singing with smiles on it. I love to tell the story. Are you telling the story? Who can you tell the story to this week? God will bring someone into your path. So friends, as we go into this week and into our lives ahead and as we think about who we are as a church in this pivotal moment in history, three identities we have this side of heaven. We are ministers. We serve others is what that means. We are ambassadors. We're representatives of Christ. We are storytellers and he has called us to live this out. But here's what happens. We're prone to forget. We're prone to forget. I don't know that for many of you I've shared something really new but we're prone to forget. So he's given us two things. He's given us each other. I can say he's given us his, his word clearly, but he's also given us something to do. And so we're going to close our time now by sharing in the Lord's Supper together. So remember that we are united in him because of Christ. There's nothing like the local church. His great love for us. And we're going to share and celebrate what he's done. And in so doing, it's a time for you not to your mind to rush out of this place or think about things going on in your life this week, but instead to say, I commit my life fully to Jesus Christ. This is for those who are believers, who come to faith in him. You've been baptized into the family. Maybe here, maybe in another church, you come to partake of the Lord's Supper. So let's all pray together and then uh, we'll be led. Lord, thank you for your word today. We praise you that we get to celebrate your gift, your sacrifice for us before we head into the beauty of this day and the week ahead. Remind us of your great love for us, that we're better together as we serve you together. In Jesus' name.